Hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMean 2024. Now, uh, this afternoon, um, Professor An Anthony Nixon will talk about, uh, well, will present a tour through rigidity theory. So over to you, Tony. Uh, okay. The slides are hope like, visible. Yes, please. Thanks, Vital. Thank you for the invitation. So, as you said, I'm going to give a, a tour through rigidity theory. Um, and what I mean by rigidity theory is the mathematical, the pure mathematical theory of rigidity. So, I'm going to try and be as basic as I can. And then, after I've told you some introductory basic stuff about graphs, about combinatorial rigidity, I'm going to do a very biased fall through some applications of rigidity. And by bias, I mean it's basically the times in my career where I've had the chance to do rigidity that's applicable to some kind of particular application. And I think I have too many slides, so I might go fast through some of those applications. If there's any particular one you want me to elaborate on, please do ask. And if you've got any questions in the beginning, please ask as we go. Okay, so um, right at the start, graphs, to me, are just abstract objects. So have a vertex set and an edge set. So edges have vertices don't have positions, they're not in Euclidean space, edges don't have lengths, which is just an abstract set and a subset of connections between them. But then I think about a geometric physical object by having some realization via a map P, which gives positions in Euclidean space to all the vertices. And then we think of the ordered pair GP as a framework or more simply a bar joint framework. So the vertices have positions, they're universal joints with full rotational freedom. And if two vertices are joined by an edge, then that's a stiff bar that takes length that can't bend, it can't extend. Okay. So for example, in two-dimensional Euclidean space, I could realize the graph of a four cycle is a unit square. Okay. And then what we care about is the rigidity or flexibility that I think you, you know and care about. So mathematically, what I'm interested in is, of course, for any rigid object, you can translate, rotate, reflect. You can do that to any object. But can you, in some non-trivial way, change the shape of your object without breaking the graph structure? So I'm not allowed to break this cycle apart so a vertex would have one edge incident rather than two, say. I'm not allowed to change the lengths of the bars given by the map P, but can I deform it in some way? And so then for the four cycle, I can just continue to shear it down. And then I translate to the size you can see that. Whereas, different example, if I put the diagonal into my four cycle, then what I did here is no longer possible because this diagonal length changed from there to here continuously as I went through. What is possible is to pick this vertex up and put it over here. Or if I was allowed to work in a different dimension to what I said, if I was working in three dimensional space, I could have my two edge turn triangle and fold them over continuously. Okay, so my definition of rigid is a continuous version, which says that every edge length preserving continuous motion of the vertices comes from isometries, comes from translations and rotations. So this one is flexible, as we showed. This one could pick it up in a different place. But I couldn't do that continuously within the space GP lived in. So this is rigid. Okay, so I'm making a distinction the continuous word is important. I think what you might care more about is global rigidity, which will come a little bit later. But this is the basic setup. Plus the main application areas in three dimensions, but that's hard, and we'll get into that in a few slides, and start at the very basics. So let's talk about rigidity in one dimensional space. So I give you a framework and you determine if it's rigid. And the answer is yes, all you need to do is check if your graph is connected. So this is a very long picture to say something very, very straightforward. So imagine you have a, a set of vertices on the line. What you think about in D dimensions, even a single vertex has D degrees of freedom. So on the line, this vertex can just go along. And there's, there's N vertices, you have N degrees of freedom. And you want your edges to reduce the number of degrees of freedom until all you're left with is the isometries that you can never get rid of. So you can imagine that if I had some disconnected graph, maybe I'll just jump straight to here, that has a red component here, a green component here. It's impossible for me now to change the distance between this point and this point in a continuous way 
but clearly I can fix this component in the slide that's gone along. Locally, it's a translation because it's, not, it's trivial, but it's changing the distance between these two because I fixed this one. It's not a global translation, so this is not rigid. It's not connected, it's not rigid. So if I connect it up, it's a blue edge or any other way of connecting it up, get a connected graph, it becomes rigid. Everything in the line is just trivial. Okay? Okay, unfortunately, if we go to dimension at least two, then the computational computer science decision problem, given the framework decided it's rigid, is challenging. Um, basically, you have whenever you have a, an edge, we can think of the squared edge length, so it just gives me a quadratic system of polynomial equations and many variables. So the best case in general, you can do a computational algebra is doubly exponential work in a basis algorithm. And it's even worse because typically in algebraic geometry, you want to solve equations over complexes or rather the closed fields. We want real solutions, which creates its own additional complications. However, what we tend to do is relax what we're interested in from being able to study every framework for looking at the generic case. So we look at almost all even a probabilistic, measure theoretic, topological sense. The definition I don't really want you to read. What I want you to think about is that generic is some constraint on what maps P will allow. And the constraint um, it re removes the possibility any two points are coincident. It removes any symmetry. It removes the chance that any set of points find the lower dimensional affine subspace than it should do. So things are just nicely typical points to my conics or any geometric degeneracy spike points. Okay, so now two dimensional examples. And so these I draw graphs. I tend not to draw the frames. So these are graphs, but think about them as realized, so let's say generically in the plane. And start in the top left. So in this case, Complete graphs are always rigid. I need some pair of vertices whose distance isn't there for there to be a distance that changes, but not to be rigid. So this K4 subgraph is rigid. So then I can think about factor out the isometries and say this vertex is pinned. And then this vertex moves on a circle centered here. So this is an obvious example to be just not rigid. Okay. If instead I pick this diagonal edge up and made this vertex at degree two, then it would move on the intersection of two circles, one centered there, one centered there, and that's the finite number of places those two circles will meet. So you can sort of see, I mean, I, I picked one up so I didn't tell you why it was still rigid, but you can sort of see this one will still be rigid. Okay. These two are harder. Building up via sequentially adding low degree vertices is easy to analyze. These ones are a bit harder, and it depends on the realization. The answer is that both of these are rigid generically, but there are interesting positions where you can draw these graphs where they move slightly unexpectedly. For example, if these six points are on a conic, then you will have a, a motion. Okay? But um, you can just believe me for now that they are rigid. So, how do we work with rigidity? We use this generic condition and a little bit of differential geometry to look at a, the rank of a matrix. So in particular, we take some map which assigns the lengths of the edges, take its Jacobian derivative matrix, and then Asimov rock through this matrix as maximum rank if and only if the framework is rigid. So what is the matrix? It has one row for each edge, and it has D columns for each vertex. So this is a, a vector difference position of vertex i minus the length of vertex j. And outside of the d columns here and the d columns here, they're just all zeros. And so it's a very star structured matrix. And it's not hard to check that in the kernel of this matrix is the d plus one choose two dimensional subspace of translations and rotations. So the maximum possible rank is dv minus that. And rigid is exactly the case when that's achieved. And not rigid suppose when it isn't. Small caveat if the graph has less than the D vertices, then it doesn't this count isn't quite working to the graph to be. But the point, point of this slide is to say if you want to test rigidity in the generic case, all we're really doing is calculating the rank of the matrix. So this is much easier than solving a system of quadratic equations. Okay, and so this is just two of the examples I've already said. Trying to give you a little bit of the intuition again. So in the first example, I have two dimensions, remember, I've got five vertices. 
So that gives you 10 columns for my matrix, and the columns are the degrees of freedom. So each vertex has two degrees of freedom, 10 in total, and then each edge corresponds to a row of the matrix, corresponds to a constraint that prevents those two vertices from moving apart from each other. And we want the radical rigidity matrix in two dimensions to be two times the number of vertices minus three. But what happens here is that this subgraph on the, the K4 has one, if you take any one of those edges away, you get a small rigid subgraph there with a distance that's determined. So we add that edge in, there's a linear dependence in the rows of the rigidity matrix. So even though there's seven rows, you get around six, which is less than seven. And that, te that tells you the flexible force test. Okay. In this case, it's all nicely rigid. You get six vertices, 12 columns, you have nine edges, nine constraints, and they're all independent. So you get like that. Okay. All right. So this is one to talk about two dimensions. So, first of all, Something I didn't say a couple of slides ago, when you say rigid if and only if this matrix has maximum rank. The really nice copy that gives me is we can do combinatorics now because it says if I give you a graph G, either every generic map P gives you a rigid framework, or every generic map P gives you a non rigid framework. So the property of rigidity depends for generic frameworks depends only on the graph. And as a result of being able to just check the rank of the matrix, we can test the rank of the matrix at random integer entries in that nice fast polynomial algorithm. So we get a nice Monte Carlo algorithm for testing rigidity of any given graph. And then in the, the 20s, still the college at Durham here went further and found a deterministic algorithm by characterizing the graph here at the terms exactly which graphs are rigid. And this picture that I think I'll skip over is illustrating that graphs with the same number of edges again can be rigid or flexible, the force actually gives you move, the same way we had on the first slide, but it's the subgraph conditions that are really crucial to determining the rigidity. But sadly, for the applications you're probably interested in, dimension at least three, in general, we cannot give such a nice algorithm. This is still true. We can always do randomized fast algorithms for testing rigidity via a matrix, but we can't combinatorially tell you outside of special cases exactly what's going to happen. Even in this generic case, where we've been nice. Okay. okay, and then my last introductory slide is a point I made already is to make the distinction between rigidity. So, this one was a, a rigid graph or a rigid framework in two dimensions, but it had a second realization by using the diagonal to reflect this vertex over and find a second realization where this distance and this one obviously are different. So this is rigid, but it's not globally rigid, which is a special case when the edge lengths determine the framework of the assumptions. So I think in the applications you're interested in when you're doing, say, a unique reconstruction of something, you want to uniquely find the reconstruction corresponding to global rigidity. If you find something that's rigid but not globally rigid, then your reconstruction could be off by clips like this. And you know, larger examples that can be many, many different ways of doing this. There could be many ways in which you're Reconstruction is not quite right if you're not globally rigid. Okay. <laughs> okay, so as I said, I want to do just go through a few things in the applied nature that I've worked on in the past, present, and the future. And by past, present, and the future, I basically mean published, submitted, not submitted. So it's a <laughs> glib version of past, present, and future. So the first one was. Um, about eight years ago. So this is a case of looking at graphene-like things. So you can imagine um, silica bias. So you take regular tetrahedra in layers. And um, so Mike Thorpe, who was a biophysicist in Arizona, was interested in these. And basically what happened is that, so I should have said that in the pictures, I was literally a silica where silicon is the red and oxygen the black. And for the biology, for whatever reason, makes these all black or this. So essentially, you could think about periodic frameworks, say, or you could just, you'd have, we'd have to get away from the genericity condition that does seem to happen in the application. So what 
the biology lab did was cut out finite pieces of the list to analyze them. And you can see that in the middle, say, the constraints on the vertex there are very different from the constraints you see around the boundary. But this triangle at the boundary is clearly able to plot, whereas before it was cut out, it wouldn't have been able to. So what the biologists would do is they would employ some kind of boundary condition around the outside. In particular, what they did was they looked at the boundary sites and they completely immobilized or pinned alternate boundary sites. So every second one they would pin. If there's not a number, there's a simple fix. Assume it's even and they pinned every single one. And then they would run an algorithm and check and find that it's rigid every single time. And so effectively, that's what we proved and removed the need for the algorithm. The reason why this is more complicated than the generic case of just ever solved in 2B is these equilateral triangles take us into a non generic world. Generic locations for the vertices tells us genericity for enough for the edge lengths that can't be satisfied by lots and lots of triangles. So we had to come up with a, a new argument. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to say is that what I find I think is really interesting is that. You, as well as looking at uh, this non-generic rigidity, we didn't really see any reason why you might want to just a pin alternate sites like in the blue here. You can look at your green boundary with your thing and put different external conditions on. So for example, you might think it's nice to restrict somebody to move only on the ground. So if we're in three dimensions, or you might be on a two-dimensional plane and say there's a groove here that a wheel can only move in its groove up here on a train line. So one of our alternative pin things was sliding constraints and saying instead of every alternate one is completely mobilized, say every single one is reduced from having two degrees of freedom to one by putting wires or, or track paths along each dot so the each vertex can move just in the one dimensional way instead. Okay. And so then it's actually that's the situation we had. Um, I think I've said basically all of, all of this. So this is just an example application. And as I said, I'm just going to scatter through a number of different examples, hoping that one of the things they say is interesting to, to some of you. Um, so the next thing was, it was, we only have theoretical results, but I think it's what I just said. So you can imagine on a, a wall, you have some vertices restricted to move on a groove. You can imagine some vehicle moving on mountainous terrain, it's, but it's restricted not to fly through. It's going to go along the road, so it's going to move in a two-dimensional way in three-dimensional space. So we looked at the general rigidity situation where your vertices, as well as being able to be joined by edges, can have loops in the graph. So a loop is an edge from one vertex to itself. And in the framework, the vertices get positions, that tells you the edge lengths. We also then say that a loop of this vertex constrains it to move on some big sapphire subspace. So in this picture, we're working in two dimensions. So that our affine subspaces are just lines. This vertex has one loop, so this, this line, this vertex has two. This is just the intersection of those two lines. Okay, and then we can understand rigidity and global rigidity in this context. So I'll skip the more of the details, but that's more theoretical. Okay, again, random jump. Another thing. So I worked a little bit on a, this particular data science application. And I think it's very different to Vitaly for the geometric data science. So I thought I would mention it. Um, so the problem we worked on is you're, you're given a high dimensional data set, and the data the place it comes from means it's expensive to sample, it's difficult to extract observations of this data, but maybe you have some reason to suspect the key information is constrained to some low-dimensional manifold within your high-dimensional data set, and you want to make inferences about your data from only taking a small number of observations. So statistically, we think of our n-vertex graph as a Gaussian graphical model, i.e. the set of n-variant normal distributions of mean zero and variance sigma, and then we look at the inverse covariance matrix, and we specify that the ij entry of the matrix is zero if you're not an edge of the graph. So we have our graphs on edges and non-edge patterns. When it's not an edge, it's always zero. And what this is saying is that the corresponding variables in our data set are conditionally independent of the order of the variables. 
Okay. And then we want to do undergraduate maximum likelihood estimation statistics. So in particular, we want to work out the number of data points needed for the maximum likelihood estimates to exist with high probability or, or in the LeBay sense, almost surely. And so this minimum number of data points we call the maximum likelihood threshold of the graph. And what we can do is understand this maximum likelihood threshold in a rigidity theoretic way. So I'll say a little bit more of this on this slide. So Caroline Ulrich showed an upper bound on this quantity in 2012. So this is a problem that was known in the 70s, but um, until she made a great breakthrough in algebraic geometry, we weren't able, no one was able to understand this in any particular detail. The way we managed to understand it was in terms of some of what we call stresses. So I told you about the rigidity matrix. Equilibrium stresses mathematically are just vectors in the code for any of this matrix. But in engineering terms, you imagine in each vertex of your framework, you have some forces or energy coming in along each bar, and those forces should be in equilibrium in each vertex. So what in, in effect, what you're saying is I'm going to weight the edges of your graph so that this force equilibrium condition holds in each vertex. And this gives you the idea of equilibrium stress. And our characterization was that the equilibrium stress we want should have a particular property, but there's a complication because this property is not a generic property. Uh, maybe I'm going too far off the slide, but the idea is you want to look at the largest possible dimension in which one of these equilibrium stresses exists. Typically, as you go up a dimension, you get more columns in your matrix, so row dependencies become less and less likely to persist. You can free yourself up. Typically, but we want the equilibrium stresses as well as the two largest dimension in which one exists. It's the largest dimension in which it exists and is also positive semi definite. So, what does that mean? It means that for every equilibrium stress, you can associate a natural quadratic form, and the matrix of that quadratic form should be positive semi definite. And the other part of the characterization is in terms of, terms of something called liftability, which is a different version of rigidity. So when I described rigidity a few slides ago, I said, given a framework of, say, two-dimensional space, is it rigid or not? And I said, we're living in two-dimensional space. Now, just for this one bullet point, think about, is a framework rigid? But given you that it's in, say, two-dimensional space, but now think of that two-dimensional space as a subspace of R to the K for any bigger K, any K you like. So can you find any dimension which has enough freedom given your realization in the two-dimensional subspace of it, can it suddenly move? So in this picture, okay, but there's no curves, that's just the illustration. I've realized this graph of a five cycle on a line, and this long edge here is the same length as the sum of all of the other edges. So whatever dimension I give you, that long edge is constraining anything else. If I try and move any of these vertices off that one line, then the sum of those lengths will not be long enough to make this, this work. So I give you that framework and give you 400 dimensions. You can't use that in any way because it's locked to be in some line fixed within that larger space. So this one you cannot lift. Whereas this one, but in a more generic way, and now if I lift this one up, you can manage to do the vertices with those edge lengths to allow it to be able to define work again in space. So this is liftable, this is not. A different kind of rigid stress. <clears throat> okay, and then just the the and the application side of this paper I'm describing at the moment, um, we were able to look at a nice paper from Ockham Line and Strimmer on plant data, and they break out some graphical models from their data. And one of the pictures in their paper was this one that with our methods we could just do by hand. We didn't even need a computer to sit down with half an hour and just work this out. By hand, so that was uh, the point there that we can deal with some settings for this Gaussian graphical model so we can find the maximum likelihood threshold, maximum likelihood estimate in a very quick way. Okay, so then, okay, so then the next thing I want to talk about, and I'll just be very, very brief. So, this is probably the most relevant area to you guys, symmetry, periodicity, 
perpetuity. But I talked about this topic in a maximum seminar a while ago, so I decided just to say a couple of words and then leave it at that. So the idea is either you take a finite group or you take a lattice and you work on periodic, or you take a mix of the two and you work on some wallpaper groups or whatever you like. But let's stick down to finite groups. So we say pick a finite group, let's take C6. And we realize it is a symmetry group. So I want to turn my alphabet group into a group of matrices, rotation and reflection. So the C6, I just have rotations. We have six fold rotation in the plane. And then instead of taking an arbitrary graph, I take a graph whose automorphism group is my finite group. And I realize the framework in the plane so that it admits the symmetry of the rotation, six fold rotation group identity. And then you ask, is it rigid? Is it flexible? And what various variants of that, in particular, some applications seem to force the frameworks to be symmetric. So I asked for my four cycle example, you, if you move it, you can imagine it has fourfold rotation symmetry around the middle of your four cycle, but if the move motion I show destroys that symmetry. So you would say there's some external reason why every motion you have to consider must preserve the symmetry. So that motion I've described is blocked and ask if it's rigid in this fourth context, or just say it happens to be symmetric, and it's just now a more complicated problem than when it's generic. And then the end part, I just say that because I'm not presenting in detail, our group in Lancaster has lots of people, lots of lots of faculty, postdocs, PhD students who like and work on symmetry, including one fantastic PhD student over here. So if you want to talk about symmetry, please talk to us. There would be lots of interest from our group. Um, okay, so what I've been doing more recently, so this is why I said that I was disappointed to miss your talk off because I, I hope there's some link between what we're talking about and what I'm going to say for the next couple of slides. So this is work that led by Kaya Kovias, who's a mathematical biologist. Um, and so she was interested in haploid organisms. So don't really know what they mean, but humans are diploid and we're half, mouse is a haploid. So it's simpler organisms is all we need to take, I think, for this. And so what she wanted to know is genome reconstruction in this setting. But she wanted to do is rather than between cells at the single cell level. So given data from, say, chromosome capture techniques, can we recover the, the genome, genome structure just from the, what comes out of those experiments? In particular, they get out contact count matrices or high C matrices, which for our purposes, we should think of roughly as adjacency matrices with some weightings of edges. So adjacency matrices can reconstruct the graph, but can we also reconstruct the, the structure and decide if it's a unique reconstruction, like it's globally rigid, or just decide if it's a, a finite reconstruction, so it's rigid. And what do we mean by a reconstruction? Should it be the larger ingredients we have described, or should it have different properties? So the main purpose of our paper was to describe the correspondence between this problem and rigidity theory. But as I just sort of hinted, it's not the normal bar joint question if you think about what the right model is. So first of all, we really spend most of the paper working on a different problem to what I described, which is given a list of distances in a graph, can you actually realize your graph as a framework? So I said at the start, here's a framework, is it rigid or not? But to even ask that question to begin with, you want to know if you start with a list of distances in a graph, do your distances just violate the triangle inequality? For some other reason, do they prevent you being able to actually realize it as an object? So this realization problem, which in biological terms, you're given one of these some data from your experiment, is there actually a 3D genome structure with that given, given um, underlying data? And then math mathematically, is what I said, do you have a realization? But we have to care about which model the realization is in. So in this biological context, you could get your, your data from microscopy data, you get it from threshold data. Um, in particular, we looked at a paper from Shri and Cheng in 2014, who looked at saying that the, the loci are in contact 
if the distance between them is below some threshold. So my picture has not come out very well, but the the idea here mathematically that we use goes back to the recent paper of Timo Jordan and Daniel Garan Bolton, and they looked at the graph is determined by saying, well, the framework is determined by saying this vertex will be adjacent to every vertex that's within a ball of unit size around it. So you put contacts when you're close enough. You build out a framework like that. So if the distance is below some threshold, say one, you put your edges in, and if not, you don't. And then you create some framework in that nature and ask if it's rigid or global. This was one of the models we considered. The other model we considered was a tensegrity like model. So, tensegrities are a, a generalization of bar joint frameworks where instead of these two vertices having a distance constraint, you can say either these two vertices have a distance constraint or we have an inequality. And the inequality could be that these, this distance cannot get longer, but it's allowed to shrink. Or well, it could be the other way around, it's allowed to expand, but it's not allowed to get short. So it's cable struts, strings, or elastic kind of thing for your edges. And then there's one more model that I'll get to on the, the next slide. But first, I wanted to show you the, the, the little bit of real data we did in this paper. So focusing again on this realization problem, we developed a semi-definite programming algorithm for how to reconstruct the 3D genome structure from the, the contact count matrices. And in some particular application, I, forgot, I didn't reference who it came from, but it was it's freely available on stem cell mouse data. Our reconstruction said that this was the backbone, and then this was the rest, the thing in the non-backbone, except it wasn't perfect, our reconstruction. The red indicates where there was errors in the, the reconstruction, so when there was a, a non-trivial distance gap from where it should have been for what we actually got in our album is just displayed by the any edge of red is not quite right. Okay, and then the, I said there was there was other models to illustrate one of those. So the model here is recreational, I think it, it looks it. So 10 years ago I could have asked you to take coins out of your pocket. Put them on the table and ask you to rearrange, see if you could arrange and how they got to move around. In this case, all the coins are pennies, they all have the same size. So instead of having what I talked about before with universal joints and edges between them, now we have pennies in contact with each other. So you have a graph of your circle packing that tells you the object is trying to decide if it's rigid or not. We're not allowed to have overlaps. Rigidity looks the same in these examples, right? These are quite simple examples that look the same, but global rigidity, hopefully you can see straight away is different. So before I said this is not globally rigid, because this diagonal, I can flip this over. But now if I try and flip this over, this circle would have to lie on top of this other circle, and that's not allowed. I've got to move my circles out on the table, maintaining the contacts. The circles are not allowed to overlap. You can only see that in very trivial examples, some of the concepts change in this model. And obviously, if all of the, the circles of zero have length of one, then the edge lengths have very strong constraints on what they can be. So it's a very non-generic situation that genuinely changes things. So we could prove some things about this, but the proofs, I guess, for this audience are less interesting. And what I was hoping to get is that when we're doing this biological problem, models like this become relevant. So I think it's interesting to study the rigidity of pennies like this. And I didn't say, but this model for these pictures was pennies, which was two dimensional. But what in the paper we worked on pennies in two dimensions and marbles, so spheres in three dimensions as well. We could say the same theoretical results in both cases. Okay. Um, I think I probably don't have time for this one. So that was about identifiability, where the main impact of it was um, in algebraic geometry. But the, the purpose of telling you about it today is that the idea is instead of having a graph and saying the distance between this vertex and this vertex is a distance constraint, let's generalize and say we're allowed to have constraints between more than two things. So have a hypergraph, maybe a free uniform hypergraph, but and the constraint maybe is the area 
made by three, three sides, say, or you could have, or you can encode a different kind of application again, which is about um, collaborative filtering in terms of recommendation system algorithms. So I'll be given a matrix, if you like, it's a positive seven definite matrix, symmetric matrix, but don't worry, I'll give you a matrix, but I only partially fill the entries. And I tell you instead, there's some gaps there that tell you it can be completed to a full matrix, but has to have a specific low rank. And then if you want to study this problem, you could look at a paper by Singer and Kukuringo from 2010, which who translated this into a rigidity problem. So now the rigidity problem, instead of having distance constraints, it has inner product constraints between the other. So if you like, it's a spherical rigidity problem. And what, what our contribution was for this sort of world was really to extend this to tensor product constraints. As I say, I wanted to skip over this bit a little bit and spend my last little bit of time talking about the future work. So the first is, again, my attempt to fit in with um, what I read of Vitaly's research interests by mentioning something about machine learning. So I have a student, a statistics PhD student, who is looking at reinforcement learning. So maybe I should start here. So the idea of reinforcement learning, which is one kind of machine learning, is to generate samples of experience using some particular policy for a problem on some training data and use the experience that you're getting from your training to identify effective decisions and then adapt or improve your policy so that the likelihood of effective decisions being made is improved. So that, that's all just wishy-washy words, but it's trying to give you the general idea that we're not doing supervised learning, but we've shown the dog how to walk by help, helping on a lead, and we're not doing unsupervised learning by letting the dog run through the streets and get hit by a car and learn not to get hit a second time. We're doing sort of reinforcement step by step, changing our policy as we go. And the context here is that what we're doing reinforcement learning for is generally for computational algebra problems in general, but the reason it's related to rigidity is what I said at the start, that we can solve rigidity by taking a system of quadratic equations and trying to do a rotor basis to work out the number of solutions, work out the dimension, the degree of the variety. But why, why is this relevant to rigidity? If the framework is rigid, when I get rid of translations and rotations, I know there's a finite number of ways to realize this. My four vertex graphics with two edge sharing triangles is exactly two. I can just click the triangle and that's all I can do. If it's globally rigid, I know the number of one is a unique one. If it's rigid but not globally rigid, it could be two, but it could be any other finite number. It just has to be less than infinity. So it's an interesting problem to work out how many there are in applications where you actually care about the reconstructability, say, if you, if you know it's not globally rigid, you get a finite number of reconstructions, maybe it's important to know how many there are so you can rule out the ones you, you didn't want. The, effectively, the best way to do this is still do globally basis Buckberger's algorithm. And the nice thing about Buckberger's algorithm, while it's really slow, is that there is a key point in the algorithm where you do a polynomial pair selection step and the reinforcement learning agent uses this selection step to learn what good choices are and what bad choices are versus a, a heuristic. And so what we were able to show so far is that the agent can do it as well as the best heuristics. The problem is that, and if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to hear them, the problem is that it's just so slow to do computational algebra problems that when you want to train on a large number of graphs, you want to run this out al this slow algorithm a large number of times. The training is expensive, and so you can't go to very large graphs, you can't get very interesting things about the work. I think this was done by Dylan Pfeiffer and his collaborators for binomial ideas. This is the sort of area that we're currently working on. And then I think. I got any time? Yeah. And I think my last slide is about a chemistry application, which I hope you don't ask me questions about because I do not know about it. So this is work of 
a great PhD student at Lancaster in our chemistry department, Alan Sherrod, and kind of supervises a, a chemist. And somehow I got involved in this because of the, the graph theory and ability side. But, so pyrene is something. They have a, a previous paper from the same group about photoactive conjugated polymers. But in short, pyrenes are these little guys that have some number of connections to other ones. In the, the wild, they can have at most four connections of ones and typically do have that many. So these are very, very sparse examples that would be built by computer and did some chemical UV his analysis just, just, just basically as a toy problem to show the difference between when there's no cycles, one cycle or more cycles in your, your graph to see how the chemistry changes in these contexts. And again, this is work in progress, but I'm hoping this is the end now. I'm hoping I've given you just a selection of problems where we can have an impact. Even if I didn't explain anything, it would be nice to talk to you about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so for recording.